Oakland Raider Highlights, brought to you by the Oakland Bank of Commerce, serving the greater East Bay area for over 30 years. The Bank of Commerce provides complete banking facilities for both individuals and business organizations. Whatever your banking requirements, savings account, commercial account, loans of all types, trust services, you like the way you're treated at the Oakland Bank of Commerce. Why not let locally managed Oakland Bank of Commerce tackle all your financial problems? now, you see at peace a place where once great gut battles raged. A season's past, but before forgot, think back those moments, glorious, when voices, many thousand strong, proclaimed a Western team victorious. That team, the Oakland Raiders, the defending AFL champions, had been the winningest team in the American Football League since 1963. In 1968, they became an undisputed powerhouse, gaining more yards and scoring more points than any other professional football team. And they did it with style. They could be gracefully spectacular. Or pugnaciously spectacular. Either way, they put the points on the board. Beat the best, and this film traces the week-by-week -week struggle of the longest, most exciting uphill battle in American Football League history. A winning preseason was sweetened by a victory over their frustrated West Bay rivals, the San Francisco 49ers. The regular season and the longest race began against the Bills in Buffalo. The defense that had earned fame in 67 as the 11 angry men did not all return, but those that did went right back to work. Tom Keating, the injured all-pro of Oakland's front four, was missing, but still there was Ike Lassiter, Big Ben Davidson, and the perennially underrated Dan Birdwell. Filling in competently for Keating was number 85, Carlton Oates. In the secondary was the great cornerback, Willie Brown. Dan Connors was still over the middle, but rookie Chip Oliver from USC was brought in to replace the injured linebacker, Bill Lasky. Despite the changes, the defense led by number 34, Gus Otto, held the bills and forced a punt early in the first quarter. Now there was another rookie and a new wrinkle in the Raiders' attack. George Atkinson, a 9-6 sprinter from Morris Brown College, opened the scoring flood that would embarrass even the strongest team. In 67, the Raiders' offense was criticized for lacking an outside pass receiver with exceptional speed. In their league debut of 68, they showed that criticism no longer fit. Quarterback Darrell LaMonica had a healthy Warren Wells at split end. That meant burning speed, good hands, and defenses would have to open up and respect the deep threat. Buffalo learned the hard way. The offensive line was sound with tackles number 76, Bob Sweas. Number 79, Harry Shue. 
Guards number 63, Gene Upshaw. Number 70, James Harvey. And Mr. AFL 00, Jim Otto, the nine-year All-Pro center. Fullback Hurick Dixon was back supplying the power running, while a speed specialist named Larry Todd gave the Raiders that breakaway threat. From their premier performance, it looked like the defending AFL champions would breeze easily to an undefeated season. The fine play continued in their next game against the young Miami Dolphins. Versatile Pete Vanizak was outstanding. Behind number 65, Wayne Hawkins, key block. Vanizak scored one of his two touchdowns on the very field that he played his college ball for Miami. At the Astrodome, the Houston Oilers defense slowed down the high-scoring machine, but a defensive touchdown by Oakland's Dave Grayson turned the game into a 24-15 triumph. Grayson would make 10 interceptions in 68 and lead the league. Finally, homecoming, undefeated, a win today over the Boston Patriots would make the Raiders number one in the West. The show put on for the home fans was nothing short of magnificent. The silver and black were enchanted. Nothing could go wrong. Even fumbles paid off. Flanker Fred Belitnikoff, following this play, picked up the lost ball and scored. It was another big win for the Raiders. Their 14th in a row, and best of all, they were now number one in the West. but it was to be the last time that they would hold that number one spot alone. In the next two weeks, the Raiders would sink to third place. It was a rainy day in October when the San Diego Chargers visited Oakland. The Chargers had number 19, Lance Allworth, and he was good, too good. But the Raiders were okay right up to halftime and only trailed 17-14. But the second half was all San Diego and Oakland lost 23-14. The myth that the Raiders were unbeatable ended and they were in a tie for second place with San Diego. In first place in their next opponent, the Kansas City Chiefs. In Kansas City, Missouri, the Oakland Raiders suffered their most humiliating defeat. The Chiefs receivers were all injured, so they relied purely on running. In fact, they set records for the most running and fewest passes in one game. But first, the Chiefs strangled the Raiders' offense. Then Kansas City mutilated Oakland's defense. With half the season gone, the Raiders dropped to third place behind Kansas City and San Diego. They had to win every game from now on or else. The demoralized Raiders returned home to face the upstart Bengals and their rookie sensation number 18, Paul Robinson. It looked like Oakland's days of glory were over. But enough, and to a man the pride and poise that had made this team, the 1967 AFL champions returned. And from then on, the Bengals never had a chance. The overconfidence of a long winning streak was gone, and the Raiders were reborn and rededicated. The test of this new dedication came quickly. The first place Chiefs were in Oakland. But this time the Chiefs running game was hell. With his runners in check, Glenn Dawson was forced to go to the air, but under pressure. And so were his receivers. The Raiders took over and quickly scored on a LaMonica hookup with Wells. But the Chiefs matched this and it was an even game after one quarter. What followed can only be described as the Oakland Raider phenomenon the devastating ability to score a cluster of points instantly. 24 points in the second quarter. 
two Banazak plunges set up by long gains. One by Hewitt Dixon on a swing pass. The other by Fred Belitnikoff. The 82-yard gain by Belitnikoff was the longest non-scoring play in Raider history. The third touchdown was a quarterback draw by LaMonica. The Chiefs' spectacular offense could never compensate for the rash of Raider scoring. Oakland won, but was still tied with San Diego for second place. But now the two were only a half game behind the Chiefs, who still held the number one spot. But LaMonica's knee was injured late in the game, and he could not play the following week. His replacement was a 41-year-old veteran quarterback who played sparingly and is used as a kicking specialist. George Blander, 19-year veteran of the football wars, had to beat the Denver Broncos to keep Oakland's title hopes alive. The old man murdered them. He threw four touchdown passes, one the longest scoring pass in Raider history, a 94-yard combination with Warren Wells. Not only did the Raiders win convincingly, they performed an important ritual in the Mile High City. A rookie running back was blooded. His first touchdown as a professional, a 64-yard burst went unheralded. But one week later in the most famous game played in 1968, the local boy from Oakland with the most unassuming name would become the most famous person never seen in the greatest game that never ended. It was the 11th week of the season, and the New York Jets, under the command of Lord Fu Manchu, Joe Namath, were in the Oakland Coliseum. It was a battle between the two most explosive teams in professional football. Perfect execution like this tight end screen to Billy Cannon for a touchdown was the standard. An injury to all-pro cornerback Kent McLuhan placed rookie George Atkinson against professional football's leading receiver, Don Maynard. Atkinson got an instant education. The lead changed back and forth six times before the score was finally tied at 29 all. Then the Jets' Jim Turner kicked a 26-yard field goal, and the Jets had the lead with one minute, five seconds left. New York kicked off to rookie Charlie Smith, who couldn't make it out of bounds. A minute and one second left. While Charlie Smith gained 20 yards, the network televising the game made the classic blunder that seeded a new expression into the American language. NBC turned off the uncompleted game in favor of a kiddie special called Heidi. Only the sellout crowd of 53,000 the radio audience and West Coast television were aware of what followed in the now famous Heidi Bowl. New York was penalized 15 yards for face masking. Then that Oakland phenomenon began with only 50 seconds left. Millions of television viewers never saw the rookie from the University of Utah named Smith become a hero in his own hometown. Once again, that historic moment and the 9-6 speed that made it possible. And still 42 seconds left. Mike Eichheide kicked off. Earl Christie bobbled it. Then his own man, number 30, ran into him and he fumbled. Preston Reidelhuber pounced on the loose ball in the end zone, and the Oakland Coliseum became an enormous secret love-in called the Heidi Ball.
Oakland scored 14 points in eight seconds and won. But the Jets were virtually the Eastern Division champs, while the Raiders, even with this great victory, were still in a tie for second place in the West. The momentum of a Heidi Bowl carried into the following week against the Bengals. This time, no rookie sensation named Robinson would burn them with an 82-yard touchdown. It was the defense's greatest day, a complete shutout. The offense was phenomenal too, gaining over 600 yards, and the Raiders beat the coming Cincinnati. Even as the Raiders defeated the Bengals, something more important was happening this week. San Diego lost to the Jets. That meant that Kansas City and Oakland, with equal records, were tied for first place with only three games remaining. Since they did not play each other, it was possible to win every game and still be tied. If so, there would be the first Western Division playoff in history. On Thanksgiving Day, the Raiders, coming off a short week, were almost upset by the visiting Buffalo Bills, but for a great defensive effort by rookie George Atkinson. The Broncos were next, and like the week before, the Raiders barely won. The difference being a 65-yard repeat of Smith's first pro touchdown in Denver. Each week, Oakland seemed to be getting weaker, while Kansas City seemed to be getting stronger. The last game of the season was against the only team the Raiders had not beaten, the San Diego Chargers. Kansas City had played its final game the day before and won easily over the Broncos, assuring them a first place finish. The pressure was all on the Raiders. It was a must win to force a playoff. By the half, both teams had scored, but San Diego led 13-10. Then the defense broke open the game. Roger Bird fought a pass away from Jack McKinnon, and the Raiders took the lead never to trail again. Even though they held the lead on spectacular plays like this 50-yard bomb to Wells, the Raiders, for the third straight week, just barely won. And worse, these very charges were the same club Kansas City had humiliated the week before, 40-3. This meant the Chiefs would be the favorites in the playoff. The Raiders, underdogs. The Oakland game plan was simple. Score quickly through the air and force the favorites to play catch-up football and abandon their strength, ball control. The plan worked perfectly the very first time Oakland got the ball. Now the defense had only to hold the Chiefs' vaunted rushing attack and they would be home free. Done. Still the first quarter, and again Oakland went into the end zone for a 14 to nothing lead. The last play of the first quarter was a post pattern to Bolitnikov, and before the Chiefs knew what hit them, they trailed 21 to nothing. In the second quarter came the defense's finest moments of 1968. The Chiefs drove inside Oakland's five yard line twice and were denied touchdowns both times. Instead, they were forced to take two field goals, less than 10 yards from the goal line. With only 28 seconds left in the first half, Fred Bolitnikov took the game completely out of reach.
What it was was just superior effort by one of football's most deceptive flankers. The moves made on all pro safety Johnny Robinson were phenomenal. But the rest, that was pure desire. You could read the final score on the faces of the players. Despite the nagging injuries, despite the longest Western Division race, despite the experts' predictions of eventual failure, despite everything, the Oakland Raiders had the discipline, faith, and desire to triumph in the West. Now they would meet the Jets in New York as defending AFL champions in quest of their second straight championship. After the Heidi Bowl, there was no real favorite. It was a struggle between pro football's two finest teams. The only factor, a violent wind that gusted up to 30 miles per hour. Joe Namath challenged the win and put New York into an early lead. LaMonica closed the margin with a strike to Bolitnikoff. But Oakland trailed all the way to the fourth quarter. Don Maynard had been Namath's favorite target against the Raiders because the veteran faces rookie George Atkinson. This time, Atkinson burned Namath and Maynard. Only a rare tackle by Namath saved a score. But Pete Banaszak made the touchdown on the next play, and for the first time, Oakland had the lead with little time left in the game. It did not take long for Namath's arm to put the Jets into scoring range. Don Maynard, although not the primary receiver, on the next play found himself the open man, and New York regained the lead. But everyone knew from the Heidi Bowl that Oakland's scoring potential was terrifying. LaMonica hit Wells for a 37-yard gain, and a piling on penalty moved the ball to New York's 12 with only two minutes left. If there were just one play in the thousands that a team executes in one season that could be replayed upon request, this swing pass would be that one for the Raiders. The loose football was a fumble that cannot be played, only recovered. The Jets took over and gave Oakland one more chance, but not enough time. The Oakland Raiders missed their date with destiny by four points, which is a lot fewer than the Baltimore Colts lost theirs by. The New York Jets made history by going to the Super Bowl and defeating the National Football League. It was a culmination of a dream for every American Football League team, and now the sports world knew what the Oakland Raiders had known for a long time. In 1963, it was pledged that the Raiders would become the finest organization in professional sports. Since then, the dynamic silver and black have become the winningest team in the AFL. But the true test of an organization is how long its success can endure. Past titles are only a plateau. The ultimate goal, a world championship under the new head coach, John Madden. Yet 1968 will live in the memory of Raider fans, for it was a season of uphill struggle to defend the title in the West than to be set back in the East. But for the Oakland Raiders, four points could not blot out a year of glory, nor could any event erase years of pride, poise, and progress with a single day of defeat. 